Well, this is exciting, nervous, everything. I'm used to standing in front of 100 people two or three times a week and singing. That's nowhere near as nervous as this. That's uh, something I do a bit, but this is totally different. And I have done it before, but not for a long, long time. So I really want the Lord to break through today in me and in you. I think that when we come in the door, we come in in a certain way. But my prayer is when we go out, we're changed. Amen. We've had a meeting with God. Somehow we've been engaged with God. And when we've been in church through the singing or the worship, the uh, communion, which was fantastic, the preaching, whatever it is, somehow we've had an encounter with God and we are changed. Amen. And we go out through that door different to how we come in. Because if we don't, we achieve nothing. We're just normal people doing a meeting like this and we might as well be the Apex Club. Just getting together and saying, g'day, having a cup of coffee, going home, and gee, it was good, wasn't it? But nothing changed. We need to have an encounter with God for something to change. Um, I toyed around with whether I would share this or not, and I'm going to. Um, Laurel and I have, you might need to get a jug, I reckon, that won't be enough. Um, <laughs> Laurel and I have been sharing with some folks that we know through our Country Music Association. And one such couple that we share a lot with is <coughs> Tony and Claire, who live at Baghdad. And we've been out there a few times and out of their place, and when we do... Uh, we sing some songs, we've got, they've got the YouTube stuff up and we sing some Christian stuff and they love it. Uh, they've got a Bible, so I say, go get your Bible, Tony. So he brings it out and I've got a passage in mind I want to read, so I'll turn to it and i read some passages, a passage, usually just a story from uh, the Gospels and then I might talk for a couple of minutes about it. But they're so receptive to what the Lord is doing and so like a sponge, really, taking it in. It's just a really good thing. Anyway, Claire was diagnosed with lung cancer a while back. <clears throat> and uh, she was on all that stuff you do for cancer, the different things, the chemos, whatever it was that she has, that different stuff that you do. She was doing all that and it was just impacting her body so much that she had to stop it. She couldn't take it anymore. And so she stopped all of that. And so she's been told, a couple of months ago, she was told Claire... We, we're stopping all the medication for you. You've got about two months to live. Anyway, yeah, it is. Laurel and I have been going out, like I say, and we went out on Friday. And uh, we got there, and she was in the kitchen, and Tony, her husband, was there, and she sort of called Laurel and I over, and we went over, and we got in a bit of a huddle, and she said, I've got some good news. I said, ah, oh, what's that? She said, well, a few days ago, that they did some tests on me. And I got the results back. I can't find any cancer, she said. Oh, That's true. That's what she said. That's what she said. That's what she said. Can't find any cancer. And uh, she said, it's gone. And she's given God the glory for it. She's given God the glory. She knows God has touched her. She knows that a miracle has happened. This is the day of miracles. The day of miracles is not over. I remember um, we had Steve McCracken, is it? it? was on the big screen there. He was supposed to come, but he couldn't come in person for some reason. I don't know why, but he couldn't come. So it was on the big screen. And when he was preaching, he got halfway through his sermon, he kind of stopped what he was preaching about, and he sort of changed subjects. And he started, and he, when he came into that second subject, he said, the day of miracles is not over. God is still on the throne. God still wants to work miracles. God still does signs and wonders, and he does them here in you, through this church. He wants to do them. And as he was saying that, the atmosphere in this auditorium changed. I was sitting there, and I noticed, I saw it. The atmosphere changed. There was faith came, and people across this auditorium were leaping onto it and saying, yeah, I believe that. God does want to work miracles. God still is on the throne. The day of miracles is not over. Hallelujah. 
today, I haven't even started yet, today, I, the thing that really moves me is evangelism. It really, really, really does. Because I was at a church where there was an evangelist. I've been to church for the first 15 years of my life and never heard the gospel preached. It's true. I know, it won't do a lot of it, but it's just a fact. <laughs> and so, 17 years of my life, God said to me, he said, I want you to go to church there. And that church that God was pointing out to me was a different church that I've been going to all my life. So I started to go to a different church. And no one invited me. No one rang me up. No one saw me in person and said, come with me to church. God said, go to church there. So I knew that they started their services at 11 o'clock in the morning. So 10 to 11, I was there, just drove my car there, and I got there by myself, went in. I knew some people that lived in the town all my life, so I knew some. And I just sat down, and I kept going there because the guy was an evangelist. He was functioning as the pastor in the church, but the truth of the matter is he was an evangelist. And I saw him years and years later, and I said, Ron, I love those sermons you used to preach. I just love them, those evangelistic sermons. He said, that's all I knew, Dennis, that's all I knew. <laughs> he was an evangelist, that's all he knew, you know. So morning and night, you're just getting the gospel, you know. And I responded to that. So that something that moved me. And it's been a theme through the morning, really. The, the ministry of reconciliation and God healing and things like that. God wants us to reach out to the lost. It moves the heart of God. So I've thinking of a title. I know that we like titles, you know. And uh, I don't know that when Peter got up and preached every time he had a title, but we kind of go with it. So, um, and Pete Seeger had a song, "Where Have All the Flowers Gone?" I thought, well, what, I might change that. "Where Have All the Evangelists Gone?" You know. Um, so that, that's the title. It's time to stir up the gift of evangelism again. So to put this on some kind of foundation, we'll go to Ephesians 4. You all know where I'm going. I'd better get my glasses out. Ephesians 4. Can you turn the pages, Sally? Can you? Yeah, I thought you were wrong. <laughs> ah, where are we? Ephesians 4, uh, verse 11. It was he, this is Paul writing, it was he, meaning Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, so that to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It was Jesus who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists. That should be in bold. Why isn't that in bold? And some to be pastors and teachers. Jesus gave evangelists to the church. They are in the same list as pastors and teachers, prophets and apostles. Evangelists are not the black sheep of the family. They're not the poor relation. They're given by God as a ministry gift to his church and they haven't passed the use-by date. They haven't passed the use-by date. We're still in the time of all of those five ministry gifts being used in the church today. And I get a little bit excited about it. I won't go too much. And I've heard people say sometimes, oh, but Dennis, that's last century, Dennis. You know, that's 
old hat, mate. You know, we don't do like that anymore. That's not how it works now. We're more sophisticated now, Dennis. We don't do that anymore. Yeah, well, I know what year it is. I know, it's, I know what century it is. The gospel is still the gospel. The evangelists are still evangelists. There's still a gospel to be preached. I don't care what year it is. The message is the same. Hallelujah. God's heart beats for evangelism. We sing a song which contains the following line. Break my heart. But what breaks yours? I can assure you God's heart breaks for the lost. The shepherd left the 99, went looking for the one. God's heart breaks for them. So when we sing that line, let our heart break for what breaks his. The lost is on his heart all the time. I want us to turn to the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Can't get my hanky out because this thing, so I'll use those. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is Paul the Apostle writing to his son in the faith, Pastor Timothy. He says, Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. I tell you what, if Paul's writing to me and he says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, I'm in. I think he knows what he's talking about, Paul. He reckons this is a trustworthy saying that's worthy of full acceptance, I'm all ears. And here it is. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. Aren't you glad he's got unlimited patience? as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life by believing on him. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Now if I was lecturing in a Bible college, which I'm not, but if I was, and I was lecturing on evangelism in particular, I'd be pointing this out in no uncertain terms. You better note this because it's going to be in the exam. I'll be telling them straight. This is, you've got to better, better know it. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Hallelujah. That's what he's come into the world to do. I can, whenever we share, teach, preach, pray, or just talk about evangelism, trust me, we have Jesus' immediate attention. He loves it. He lives for it. He died for it, for evangelism, to save the lost. God's church... Our church needs a fire of evangelism today. We cannot wait any longer. The need is too great and the time is too short. The need is great and the time is short. We need to stir the fire of evangelism in our hearts and we need to do it now. You know, I... That's called the end of the beginning. <coughs> I want to give credit where credit is due. And I remember when we came back after the COVID break, we had a COVID break, and we couldn't come to church at all for a good while, it was some months. And when we did, we came back off that break, and Adrian stood here, 
And he said, I believe that God wants us to return to the basics. I don't know if anybody else can remember him saying that, but that was the thrust at that time. I want us to come back and return. God, I believe God wants us to come back to the basics, to the fundamentals. And we spent plenty of time doing that, talking around that and preaching about that. But I believe that is true because the basics include evangelism. It's the basics. It's part of the basics. It's not something you do three years down the track. It's fundamental. It's part of the beginning process. It's the basics. And look at the Great Commission. And I want to do that again today. And I want to... If you look at um, Matthew 28, which we did, and other verses as well, which we did as well, you'll see in your Bible there... Uh, the last three verses of Matthew 28, there's a little going to be, I'm sure in everybody's Bible will be, there's a subheading there saying the Great Commission. And that's a bit misleading because even though that is true, that does contain the Great Commission. It's not all of the Great Commission. But that little subheading is not anywhere else. It's just there. So you think you read that, you read the Great Commission. But it's only part of the Great Commission. I believe there are four passages of Scripture that all together come to the Great Commission. And we have looked at them, but I want to start by looking at Mark 16. So if you have your Bibles there, turn to Mark 16. Because I believe the Great Commission is contained in these passages. It's the time when Jesus was together with his followers immediately prior to his ascension and on that occasion he'd been uh, crucified buried resurrected and he spent 40 days on earth talking with his disciples and meeting with them and on this occasion this was going to be the last time immediately prior to him ascending into heaven and he said some things to them on that occasion when you add all those things together that to me is the great commission this was the last time this is important i'm not going to be here anymore i'm going and so this is what he said on that last occasion. He said, go into all the world. This is uh, Luke, Mark, sorry, Mark 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons they will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. They will drink deadly poison. It would not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. They will recover, I think the King James says. Now, that, that's all in red. That's the words of Jesus. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. But that was the occasion when immediate, immediately prior to Christ's ascension, that's what he said to his, to his followers there. Go into all the world and preach the good news or the gospel to all creation. Now if you turn with me to the passage I mentioned before, Matthew 28... At the end, in red, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So if all authority has been given to Jesus on heaven and earth, how much authority does Satan have? He has none. Jesus has got all the authority on heaven and earth. So therefore, Satan has none. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of that, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the very end of the age hasn't come yet. So he's still with us. He's still with us to the very end of the age. 
So they, therefore go and make disciples. So the Mark reading tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The Matthew reading tells us to go into all the world and make disciples. They are the two main mandates. They are the basics. That's as basic as the church gets. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. To go into all the world and make disciples. Now we're going to need help to do that. And Luke 24 is where the help comes from. Luke 24. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You know you can't understand the scripture unless your mind's been opened, don't you? It's a spiritual thing. We need spiritual enlightenment to understand spiritual things. So he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is in red, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Until you've been endured with power from on high. Now, when I first started attending Pentecostal churches, that, that sort of stuff was very prominent. We need the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We need the power from on high. We cannot achieve those two mandates. We cannot go into all the world and preach the gospel. We cannot go into all the world and make disciples until we've been endured with power from on high. Otherwise, we're just doing it at our own strength. It will fall over. It will come to nothing, do more harm than good. And so we need the power of the Holy Ghost to enable us to achieve what we are called to do. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. So these words were spoken again immediately before his ascension, all part of what I think makes up the Great Commission, those, that last occasion when he spoke with them. And finally, Acts chapter 1. which was written by Luke as well. And we're starting at verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion... While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. <clears throat> Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met him, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Which is just a side issue. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority. Now, get back on track. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. Just a reinstatement, if you like, by Luke of what he said at the end of his gospel that we need the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism, we need the fire, the unction of the Spirit of God the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit to achieve the basics, the preaching of the gospel and the making of disciples. There's only one great commission. It hasn't changed, hasn't been altered, hasn't been amended, hasn't been rescinded. Our church today is operating under the, not, not operating under the Great Commission 2.0. There isn't a 2.0, there's only one. There's only one. Here it is. This is the Great Commission still. It hasn't changed.
heard a guy say once that when it comes to church activities, church functions, things that we do, if they're not funneling back into one of those two mandates, if they're not funneling back into either preaching the gospel and aiding in that, or preaching back into um, making disciples and aiding that, then why are we involved in them? Those two things are the main things, preaching the gospel and making disciples. I think Adrian was right. We do need to return to the basics. Now, I've got to talk about basic. I've got a book here, Basic Evangelism. And I am basic. <laughs> and so I, have, I had this for a fair while. I don't know when I got it, to be honest. I'm not sure. Had it a long time. But I want to read a little bit out of it. Not much, just a bit. And the chapter I want to read from is called The Evangelistic Church. Now, this, I'll give you some of the headings. So there's evangelistic, there's pastoral evangelism, visitation evangelism, educational evangelism, and there's rural evangelism and evangelism beyond the doors of the church and others as well. So basic evangelism. But the chapter I want to read from is called The Evangelistic Church. And the author is a guy called C.E. Autry. It's an American book. And he says this, Jesus had but one mission on this earth, and that mission was to seek and to save the lost. When Jesus called Zacchaeus out of the sycamore tree, went home with him for lunch, and won him to salvation in the face of the criticism of the people who witnessed it, he justified his actions by saying, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what Jesus came for. Jesus said to his disciples, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. It was the purpose of Christ to use his disciples to win the world to himself. Therefore, Jesus instituted the church for this definite purpose, he intends that his church would perform many other tasks, but its supreme task is to bring the lost to Christ. That's a supreme task. That's what we're here to do. He goes on, he says, a church which from pulpit to primary department, now that means from senior leadership, pulpit, senior leadership through to the Sunday school department, a church which from the pulpit to primary department works passionately to see people continually coming to Christ is evangelistic we need to be seeing people continually coming to Christ it's not just a one week a year thing where we put on a special crusade or something we want people to be continually coming to Christ and that is an evangelistic church when we're seeing that where people from the pulpit to every department is working passionately to see people continually coming to Christ that church is evangelistic he goes on, he says, many of our churches, large and small, rural, village, town and city, do have pastors, church officers and Sunday school teachers permeated with the desire to see people find Christ as saviour. That's a fantastic phrase, isn't it? Permeated with the desire to see people find Christ as saviour. Oh God, let us be like that, where everybody's permeated with the desire to see people find Christ as saviour. They're trying to bring all possible to this necessary experience. It's a necessary experience. Every member must become a soul winner. The program of evangelism of the New Testament is dedicated to this aim. And he, next chapter he talks about the local church is where this happens. We are a local church. It's where it happens. Unattached and unauthorised evangelism out there by people that are not really under any authority, Lone Ranger style, doesn't do really cut through. It's in the local church where evangelism works best. It's where the authority is. Every 
thing that the church does, all that power, all that authority, everything, all the ministry is in the local church. We need a, we need a local church where all of that exists. I think this morning I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had all those seats where, where you're all sitting, all filled with youth? Four or five rows back, right in those middle sections, all young people on fire for Jesus. I've been in churches where it's like that and you need all those churches, any church that's going anywhere has got a great youth group. So those two things go hand in hand. You need a great youth group. You need great youth group leaders. God, give us great youth group leaders. Bring them in, Lord. Bring them in. Build up the youth who come in and love the Lord Jesus, the smile on their face, the way they talk to you. It just does something for you. And we, we're going to not be forgotten either. Don't worry about that. We'll be here. But we'll, just, we'll be somewhere else, not there. But it's just wonderful to see all the youth. It just does something to me. And we need to pray that in. God, give us youth. Give us youth group leaders. Great youth group leaders build great youth groups and great churches around Valley. This is we want to be an evangelist. This chapter is called the Evangelistic Church. That's what we want, don't we? Every department, right through, permeated with the desire to see people find Christ as Saviour. To do everything possible to bring about that necessary experience. basic how can we become an evangelistic church well I want to look at Matthew chapter 4 so I'm throwing out a bit of a challenge now Matthew chapter 4 How can we become this sort of church that Autry talks about? As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, verse 18, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, in red, Jesus said. And I'll make you fishers of men. In red. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. That's basic, isn't it? Come, follow me. It's not a whole long list of 20 things. Do this, 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 and I'll make you fishers of men. It's come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. It was like that with Matthew, the tax collector, wasn't it? He went, came to Matthew. He said, follow me. And Matthew, I don't know, understand. I've never been a fisherman, so I'm not sort of so associated with these folks. But Matthew, I do. He was an office man. I worked in office. And he was upstairs and Jesus came in. He said, come follow me. And he logged his computer off, picked up his lunchbox and walked out. Straight away. Went to his locker and cleared her out and went. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now that same story is in Mark, so we won't read that because it's more or less word for word the same. Luke chapter 5. One to eleven. Luke five. One day 
as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. You're not letting them down for nothing. Let down the nets for a catch. Jesus knew. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets because you say so. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, in red, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Hallelujah. You will catch men. Don't worry about catching fish. You'll catch men. What a challenge. What a mandate we have. It's ours. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The good news. And you'll catch men. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. If we're going to be an evangelistic church that Mr. Autry describes, a church that fishes for men, then we need to leave other things behind and follow Jesus. Are we a church, this is the challenge, are we a church that is successfully fishing for men now? No. I'm, I'm opening it up and, and so I'll, I can give 50 different answers, but you're right, that's the answer I had too. But if you yeah, anybody can answer. Yeah, no, the answer is no. Are we at fault or is Jesus at fault? Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So if we're not fishing for men successfully, really, is the fault with us or is the fault with Jesus? Is Jesus saying, look, you guys are following me. You're doing a great job. You couldn't follow me any closer if you wanted to. But I don't care. I'm not going to do any. I'm not going to make you fishers of men. Is Jesus the one who's letting the side down or is the fault with us? It's with us, isn't it? It's, it's, Jesus is there waiting to make us fishers of men. He said, I will do it. The one requirement is to follow me. Follow me. <coughs> so if we, my challenge is to align ourselves so that we follow Jesus more closely. And that's going to mean different things to different people. I remember when I was, how old was I? 27, 28? And I was, I think I might have shared this once before, I was playing basketball, and I'll tell you about when I was captain coach. I'd moved to Launceston, and I was a reasonable basketball player without being fantastic, I was reasonable. And I'd played for the state in under 18s, so I could play reasonably okay. And I moved to Launceston, and I thought, well, what, I didn't know anybody, so what can I do? And the church I was going to, the lady there played basketball for a team in the Baptist church basketball roster, their competition. And she, she played for a team called St Andrews, which is sort of a Presbyterian church, but it was playing in a Baptist church thing. And so she said, do you want to come along and play basketball? And I thought, that's not a bad idea. I, I can 
play basketball reasonably okay, so I don't know anybody, why not go and play basketball? Meet a few people and, you know, something to do a couple of nights a week. So I did. And played the first year. And when we started the second year, they said, Dennis, we'd like you to be captain coach for the team. So I said, yeah, it's okay. I'd done a fair bit of coaching before, underage stuff and, and men's and women's. I'd coached before. Yeah, I'd, I'd do that. That's fine. So I was the coach of the team. And we're going along okay. We're sitting about third or fourth on the, right, on the ladder, something like that. And about halfway through the competition, the roster, the Lord said to me, Dennis, I want you to give up basketball. That was my follow me. And I thought, well, I can't do that, Lord. I don't know if you've noticed, Lord, but I am captain coach of the side. <laughs> you know, I might have just slipped your mind there. You didn't, didn't notice that. He said, yeah, I was actually aware of it. And so I've battled with that for a while. I thought, I can't, I've got responsibilities here. I can't just quit, you know, because I'm a Pentecostal. When I'm playing in this roster where the churches aren't Pentecostal. They go, yeah, look at them. That's what they're like, you know, unreliable. Chandelier swingers, you can't trust them, you know. And I thought, Lord, I can't do that, you know. Anyway, this, this went on for a month or more with me, I'm in an arm with the Lord about it. And then I twisted my ankle. And uh, I couldn't play. And one of the guys in the team said, just run it out. And I said, yeah, sure. It's worse than that. <laughs> you know, it went up all black and blue and I was really bad and I could hardly walk. And anyway, so I couldn't play for a couple of months, a couple of weeks, I should say. I couldn't play. And then there was the church conference coming up in Hobart. I was, just, I was living in Launceston at the time. There was a church conference in Hobart and I wanted to go to it. I was getting to that point, I was 27, 28, where I was becoming more interested in the things of God and the church and growing into that ministry things and things like that. And I was just sort of growing more into it and I wanted to go to this church conference. And it was on a weekend and the basketball was on Saturday night. And we're in the finals now. Oh, Dennis, I'm captain coach of the team, Lord, you know. If we lose, we're out. Well, I think we're, we're playing off in the third and fourth position, you know, so if we lose, we're gone. And it was on the weekend of this conference in Hobart. Anyway, I chose to go to the conference in Hobart. We lost the game, but I've never played a game of competitive basketball since. But that was... My, and there's, there's lots of other examples. That was my follow me moment. What's God saying to you? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. When the fishermen were there, they immediately left their boats, their father, their nets, and they, one passage says that they pulled their boats up on the shore, on the bank. Now, it's one thing to walk away from fishing and leaving your boat sitting in the water. It's still there, isn't it? But you, when you pull her up on the bank, you, you're saying, I'm done, aren't you? You, know? you pull your boat up and put her on the bank, I'm not going back. That's it. And that's what they did. What is the Lord Jesus saying to us today? Remember I said early, go out that door different. What is God challenging us about? You, individually. Everybody's different. What habit, what language, what addiction, what, what, what is God saying to each of us? Follow me, follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Put everything else aside, put it all aside, leave it. The time is too short, the need is so great. We can't delay any longer. It's time to, for evangelism to arise now. I know it's in your hearts too, isn't it? You, you, you're with me. You understand. Can we determine from now on to change that, to do it? Follow me. I've got a song. This song I learned at the Baptist Church Youth Group. 
It's got actions. But looking at the age, it might be hard to do them. So in some words in this song, begin with the letter M. And as it happens in the English language, so does the word male, begin with the letter M. And so whenever we sing a song beginning with the letter M, all the men stand up until we've finished singing that song. Then you sit, that's finished singing that word, then you sit back down again. Until we come to the next word, starting with the letter M, then you stand up again. Until we finish singing that word, then you sit back down again. Until we come to the third word, starting with M, then you stand up again. Etc., etc., etc. Also in this word, in this song, there's words starting with the letter F, which coincidentally in the English language, so does female. So whenever we sing a word beginning with the letter F, all the ladies stand up while we sing that word, and then you sit back down again when we finished it. Until we come to the second word beginning with F, then you stand up again, and then you sit down again. Until we come to the third word, then you start like that. So any word starts with M, the men stand up while we sing that word. Any word starting with F, the ladies stand up while we sing that word. So, figure as much. <coughs> I'll go slowly. I will make, that starts with M, I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make, it up Malcolm, fishers of men if you follow me, if you follow me. If you follow me, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. How are we going? I saw some up and downs, did a good job, a good job. That was a warm up, did a good job. <clears throat> some are still standing and they should have been sitting, but I know some people's movements are limited, I understand all that. So do what you can do. And we'll go through it again, a little bit quicker this time. <coughs> Not too much quicker, just... Two, three, four. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me. If you follow me, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. I wasn't watching you. How are you going there? I wasn't watching you, Neville. How did you go? All right? All right? I wasn't watching you. Did that, did that okay? Yeah? <laughs> Who needs a defibrillator? Everybody all right? There's one out there. <laughs> one last time. <laughs> A little bit quicker again this time. No, you, you take it easy. <laughs> Two, three, four. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Give yourself a hand. Great job. The youth group couldn't have done any better. <laughs> well done, well done. Having said that, the challenge, of course, is there, isn't it? I'm throwing out the challenge. Follow me. What does that mean for each one of us? If you've felt that that is, Lord is saying something to you, there's something I need to adjust, something I need to change, something whatever, then the, the altar is open. Say, Lord, 
I know evangelism is on your heart. Break my heart. What breaks yours? I want my heart to break. So what breaks yours? There's a gospel to be preached. There's good news. I haven't even gone, gone into what it is, but there's good news. Jesus died and he rose again. The universal problem of sin has been resolved. Everybody has that problem. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, no, not one. We all have a sin problem. But Jesus paid the price. That's good news. And there are people, trust me folks, there are people out there waiting to hear it from you. Waiting to hear it from you. They are soft. They are not anti-God. I know there's some out there that are, but there's lots out there that are not anti-God. They just never heard of him. They just need you and I to go out there and preach the gospel. Share the gospel with them. Tell them God loves them. Tell them God died for them. They'll lap it up like a sponge. They're not anti-God. They just need to hear it. And now is the time we are still in. God says, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. The end of the age has not come. The power of the Holy Spirit is available now for each one of us. If you feel stirred, the altar is open. I don't know, maybe we could play something, could we, just a little, little bit? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Help us, Lord, help us. We want to follow you, Lord. We're not against you. We want to follow you. Lead us, Lord. Lead us. Wherever you go, I will follow. My God, my God, my God. My God, my God, my God. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God. My God, my God, my God, my God. Your friends your family, people you work with, people you know. They need to hear the gospel. And who else are they going to hear it from? You're Johnny on the spot. You're God's man. You're God's ambassador on the spot. You're there with the gospel, the good news. I surrender I do, Lord. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Let's sing it one more time. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen, amen, amen. Lord, let it be so. Let it be so. Jesus, let it be so. This is a faithful saying, worthy of full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Oh, God. God, 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 God. Lord, we give ourselves to that. Jesus, we humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves before you. Oh God, the call of the gospel. Come, follow me. The call of the gospel from Jesus. Lord, we pray that this area of Kingborough and the greater Hobart and all of Tasmania and this nation of Australia would feel the call of the gospel. 
right across this nation to be stirring churches, stirring like-minded to call, Lord, the ones you've preordained. Call them, Lord, out into the gospel. Call them into your family. That we lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. Thank you, Father.